Okay. All right. This is our last week, ladies and gentlemen, in the wonderful world of CE 414. Um, I have two remaining topics to cover this week, which is uh, shear capacity and um, local buckling. But there's a little bit of a theme with this week, um, and the theme is, I guess I would say, everything else. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, we have a 14-week course in steel design, and so I, uh, you know, obviously can't cover literally everything there is to cover in the land of structural steel design. Um, the truth is that you all may graduate and do a problem in the real world that's outside what we covered in here. And so the question is, are you going to be able to handle that? Uh, my response to that is, well, what you need to be able to do is read this, okay, and really read it. So today's uh, topic of shear capacity, which for most building members, I, I think we all realize is not the biggest deal in the world, um, I have prepared my slides in such a way that we're going to have to actually open this thing and read it a little bit today to actually know how to compute shear capacity. I'm doing that because I want to force you all how to do that. Okay. So while I'm uh, uh, doing this example today, I want everybody to turn to 16.1-75 um, because we're going to use the manual today directly, use the spec directly. Okay. Now, we're not going to use it like right right now because I want to talk about some background, bless you, related to, um, uh, uh, to steel design or, or related to shear. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, to mention that, uh, but we are going to reference that. Now, um, I, I don't have this here on the slide, but I guess I should just make sure everybody's clear in mentioning this. We do not have an in-person class on Wednesday, okay? Wednesday, I have a pre-recorded lecture uh, on local buckling. That's going to be our final topic. Um, classification of a section related to local buckling is an incredibly easy task. But also buried in that lecture is what happens if an element fails local buckling. Uh, and it does not mean that the section explodes when you put a feather on it. It just means you have to compute the capacity differently. And how do I mean compute the capacity differently? I mean read the spec. So that's kind of what uh, maybe my, my hidden theme of, of this week is. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and uh, uh, sort of jump into shear capacity. Um, what I'm going to do for this discussion, though, is I'm going to take us on a brief detour and talk a little bit about shear in general, okay? Now, everybody in here has, should have seen this stuff before in Engineering 216, but I know Engineering 216 was ages ago, and, and it's been some time since you looked at this, so I want to talk about shear, and specifically transverse shear stresses in the Elements like where does shear forces come from? Okay, so if we have a beam and we subject it to loads, by now we should recognize that we can draw a shear and moment diagram for those loads. Okay, now for this slide, <coughs> I have a simply supported beam with a point load in the middle. Okay, um, I have a very specific reason for using this beam. Uh, my reason for that is. We have a beam that has a linear moment diagram, but the shears, by all rights, are constant. Okay, From here to here, we have a constant shear, and here to here, we have a constant shear. Really, the only difference is just the sign change. Okay, We know that <coughs> bending moments generate bending stresses. Right? We can take bending moments, M, and compute sigma equals MY over I. So we get bending stresses from bending moments. Do we get shear stresses from shears? The answer is yes. Okay, We do get shear stresses uh, as well. Now, where do those shear stresses come from? Okay, Well, what I want to do is I want to uh, take out a little bit of a slice of the beam, and we'll say that that slice is dx wide. So you all remember dx is just that itty bitty 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 uh, width, you know, infinitesimally uh, thin. Okay. But I'm drawing it kind of thick just to kind of uh, illustrate what's going on here in terms of uh, 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 the stresses here. Now, what happens is transverse shear happens because equilibrium in this element has to be maintained in some way or another. So let's take a look at the shear and moment diagram. Okay. Now, here's my element. I want to look at the left side of the element, and I want to look at the right side of the element. 
on the left side of the element and the right side of the element, we have the same shear value, right? We have a shear value here and a shear value here. The shear values are the same, okay? But moments are different, right? If we look at this side of the element and this side of the element, we have a change in moment. The moment goes from a being a smaller value to a higher value. Does everybody see that? Okay. So if I look at this from an equilibrium perspective, so here's that element, and I'm looking at that element in 3D. So on the left side of that element, I have bending moment, and on the right side of that element, I have bending moment, but those bending moments are different, right? Here I've got you know, some bending stress profile, and here I've got some bending stress profile where this is sigma, and I'm saying this is sigma plus some increment. And where am I getting that increment? I'm getting that increment from the fact that from here to here, the moment changes, okay? We get a little bit of an increase in moment, okay? Now, if I look at this from an equilibrium perspective, from a sum of forces in the x direction type problem, this section looks like it's not in equilibrium, right? Because there's a different set of forces or stresses over here than they are over here. So the sum of forces this way are not equal to zero. So how does the beam not run away from you uh, in this uh, uh, fashion. The reason is because of the transverse shear stresses. Okay, It is the transverse shear stresses that, that that's where the, the, the difference is made up of. Um, the best way of describing transverse stresses is imagine that you had yourself a, um, imagine you have a notebook or a, uh, a workbook that's relatively thin. Okay, I'm going to use these pages here to kind of make the point. Okay. Now let's say I take this this workbook and I bend it. Okay. It's pretty easy to bend this, right? The reason why is because I'm holding what is this? A hundred pages? Would you agree with that? Whatever, right? I propose that this is a hundred cantilever beams, individual beams that have about this much stiffness, right? So they're really easy to bend back and forth. Like it's really easy to deform this. Now imagine I had way too much time on my hands and a few sticks of glue, and I glued every one of these pages together and pressed them together, right? Now try and bend it. It's going to be a lot harder to bend, right? Everybody would agree with that? It's going to be a lot harder. The reason why is because once the pages are glued together, they're not allowed to slide against one another, right? Okay? What's happening in between the fibers of a, uh, of a beam when it's being loaded is that these fibers, so we, we bend the beam, right? We bend the beam. This way, the fibers of the beam are wanting to slide against one another. So between these surfaces, I develop a shear stress, okay? So that's where the equilibrium comes from. That's, where the, the, uh, that's how we meet equilibrium, that we get a force in between each of these, um, each of these surfaces. And that force is just the area, the width, times the, the thickness, times this shear stress, okay? Now, the whole point in Engineering 216 is to derive a formula for that shear stress, and so it involves integrating across the section and setting equilibrium and all that, and when it's all said and done, this is the, the uh, expression that you get. Again, this is not Engineering 216, so I'm not going to go through that process of deriving all this in here because you've already seen it, okay? I'm just wanting to r remind you of this formula. Does everybody remember this formula? Tau equals VQ over IB. You probably didn't use it very much. It's not a star of the show in deformables as sigma equals NY over I is, but I know you've seen it before. Everybody okay with this? Okay, now, um, I don't need you to use this formula in here. You're not going to have to uh, reproduce this, but I do want you to kind of understand how it behaves, okay? Because in order to calculate the shear stress and a beam at any given point, so here's the beam, we're loading the beam, if I want the shear stress any point in the beam, I calculate it as VQ over IV. Okay? Now, two of those terms are constant. The shear is a constant, and the moment of inertia is a constant. What varies is this term Q, which is just sort of like a first moment of area uh, from the centroid. But what also varies is the width. The width of the beam varies, particularly in steel design. See, the term B is on the denominator. Okay? So if I'm looking at an I-beam, something like this, okay, so here's what the shear stress profile looks like for a regular old rectangular cross-section. But what about an I-beam? Well, what happens from here 
to here, okay? As I'm going up, uh, if, as, if I start here and work my way up, once I get to this point right here, the term B suddenly goes from this width to this width. Does everybody see that? So on my shear stress profile, I get this sudden jump in shear stresses, okay? This is what the shear stress profile looks like for a rectangular cross-section, but this is what it looks like for an I-shaped cross-section. And so where do W-shapes or I-shaped beams, where do they carry most of their shear stresses? In the web, right? That's where, that's where shear tends to be the, 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 the biggest, that's where it shows up, is in the web. So when we look at shear capacity of W-sections, we're going to be looking primarily at the web. That's what we're going to be looking at. Okay, does that make sense? That's why, uh, so a lot of times you'll um, hear steel designers say that the web is what carries the shear and it's the flanges that carry the moment because uh, um, changing the sizes of the flange is what has the biggest impact on increasing your moment of inertia, which has the biggest impact on increasing your moment capacity uh, and whatnot. So you'll, you'll hear the term you know, flanges carrying the moment, uh, webs carrying the shear uh, quite a bit in steel land. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. So let's look at shear capacity. Now, <coughs> um, the thing about shear is um, shear capacity is a function of both shear yielding and shear buckling. Okay? Um the best way of showing you what's going on is, I'm going to pause my recording real quick. I'm actually going to pull up this YouTube video because I actually want you to see this. Um, this is it's a lot e easier for me to show you than it is to, um, to, to, to draw. <coughs> oh, let me go back here. There we go. So the idea, um, when we're trying to predict the capacity of a steel element in shear is we're trying to figure out one of two things. Is it going to yield or is it going to buckle? Okay. If it's going to yield, the capacity calculation is pretty simple. We just take the yield stress, we take the area of the web, which is D times TW, right? Uh, I mean, I think now we kind of understand why the web is important. So we take Fy times the area of the web, and then we multiply it by 0. 0.6. Remember that whole 0. 0.6 term I mentioned that was going to show up again? Well, here we go. We're in shear, so we adjust that by 0. 0.6. Now, if shear buckling happens, which is what we saw in that video, then um, we're going to have, you know, inelastic buckling, elastic buckling, and the, the equations are going to be, or the, the, the pattern is going to be very similar to what we saw for columns and beams, okay? Um, the one thing that is... Um, <coughs> that is going to need to be clarified in the spec, because today's goal is to look at the spec, is if we need transverse stiffeners. Okay, So as you saw in that video, there was sort of a plate here and a plate here, and it sort of constrained the buckling to that, that what we call that panel. Okay, um, So these transverse stiffeners can serve to improve the shear capacity. And while the math is quite different, it does sort of have the same feel of spacing out stirrups in reinforced concrete beams. You, know, you look at the shear pattern or the shear diagram uh, and space them out accordingly. Um, so the idea is that the closer these panels are together, these stiffeners are together, the more improved the element's capacity is in shear. So this might be what shear stiffeners look like uh, in the real world. Okay. Now shear stiffeners add money because that's more cutting, more welding, etc. Uh, sometimes they're necessary. Um, you'll find in most building beams, we don't need them except for maybe transfer girders and whatnot. But in bridges, you'll find shear stiffeners a lot more ubiquitous because you know you can't. Um, you know there really aren't any roll beams that are you know 150 foot long, right? So you're having to, to develop a plate girder. So you're able to shave a lot of weight uh, of steel off of that for that plate girder. But in order to do that, you might have to add a stiffener or two. Now. Like I said, today's um, uh, uh, lecture is all about navigating the spec. And I purposefully did not give you like everything in the slides as I've done before because I want you to have some familiarity with the spec. I want to actually read the spec today. Okay. So um, what we're going to do, though, is we are – I do want to mention a couple of things. 
So there are two things about uh, shear that are different. Okay. Um, first thing that I'll mention about shear that is slightly different is the fee value. In most cases, fee is 0.9, but there are actually a few cases where the fee value changes. This is the first time this has happened. We haven't had this case yet. And the fee value changes dependent upon the web slenderness. Okay, so we're going to have to actually figure out whether or not this is the case. Um, the other thing that you're going to see when you actually look at the spec is you're going to see that the capacity is, the nominal capacity is taken as 0 0.6 times Fy times the area of the web times this term CV1. And this term CV1 is a reduction factor to account for the possibility of the web buckling. Okay, So we're going to have to compute CV1. Notice the spec does make our life a little bit more uh, um, straightforward when it comes to calculating C CV. In fact, it tells us that CV equals 1 for a, a lot of given shapes. We're actually going to verify that today uh, uh, with our example, but I'll show you how this works. But again, kind of the idea today is to get familiar with navigating the spec. Speaking of, I want to look at this example. I want to compute uh, VBN for this beam. Okay, so we're going to compute VBN for a W um, 24 by 62. Okay, um, we're going to compute W 21 or for a VBN for a W 24 by 62 again to get familiar with navigating the spec. Now. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is table 3-2. Uh, I think this is from the older version of the manual, but it doesn't really matter. And then for a um, W24 by 62, we find that VBN is 306 kips. Okay? So at a minimum, we better get 306 or we're doing something wrong. Okay? So we at least have our answer. Let's see if we can get to that. Okay. Now, <coughs> the first thing that I'm going to get, do is um, I'm going to say, okay, um, for a W24 by 62, I'm going to need some properties. I'm going to go ahead and give you these properties right now because I want everybody to be in Chapter G right now. I want, uh, I'm going to need the D value, which is 23.7 inches. I'm going to need the web thickness, which is 0 0.430 inches. And I'm going to need H over TW, which is 50.1. And by the way, you don't need to calculate H over TW. Um, if you look at the W sections, um, okay, maybe we ought to go ahead and turn to the W sections. Let's go ahead. Let's turn to 1 dash, what is it, 20. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So if we turn to 1-20 and we look at the W section, one of the things that you will notice is that here's the W24 by 62. If you look over here on the right page, you will see this um, column called compact section criteria, and you see this term H over TW. H over TW is a slenderness. It is basically a measure of how slender the web is whereas the other term is a measure of how slender the flange is. I'm going to talk about those in much more detail in that pre-recorded lecture on Wednesday, because um, that's how we classify local buckling. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that, uh, that you don't need to compute this term, that it's computed for you. And then the D and the TW uh, is, you know, that's just easily reported. Okay. Okay. Is everybody with me so far? Okay. Now I want everybody to turn back to 16.1-75. Um, because again, I think this is really important that you're able to just navigate the specification. Because we're going to have, or you're, you as engineers are going to have problems that I didn't teach you how to do. And so you can't be scared of the spec. You've got to be able to negotiate. Okay? So let's... Um, Let's turn to 16.1-75. Okay. <coughs> so let's go through this. Design of members for shear. I'll tell you what I'll do. I will pull it up here on the screen so that we're all looking at the same thing. I go here. I have the actual specification itself. Uh, and I can just, you all can download this on Blackboard or from AISC. 
And here we are. So let's make this wide. We can all kind of see what's going on. Okay. Design of members for shear. Okay, so this is, we're looking at shear capacity, so we're going to look at chapter G, so on and so forth. This chapter is organized as follows. Um, and so let's look at the chapter organization. So we're looking at a W section, right? We're looking at a W section, a W24 by 62. So we don't have to worry about web openings. We don't have to worry about minor axis shears. That would be if we took the I-beam and flipped it this way and loaded it like that. We're not really worried about HSS, single angles. We're ultimately going to be in G2, right? That's, that's the section we're going to be in. But let's read G1 real quick. So let's read what G1 says. Okay, so G1, design provisions. The design shear strength and the allowable shear strength, we're ignoring ASD, uh, shall be determined as follows. For all provisions in this chapter except G21A, it says fee is not. Okay? Except G21A. Okay? So what is G2? G2 is I shaped members and channels. We're looking at shear strength of webs. What does it say? G2 section 1. The nominal shear strength is as follows. So the nominal shear strength is VN is 0.6 FY. Uh, a, W, C, B, 1, right? So if I wanted to compute the design strength, the design strength would be phi times that, right? So that's what we're trying to do. Phi, V, N equals phi times all of this, okay? So I need to figure out what F, Y is, what A, W is, what C, B, 1 is, okay? F, Y... I know what that is. That's 50 KSI. How do I know that was 50 KSI? Because that was given. I know that it's a W24 by 62, it's 50 KSI. I know that. Okay. So let's read down. So what is FY? FY is the specified minimum yield stress. What is AW? AW is the area of the web, the overall depth times the thickness. So this is 50 KSI. This term right here is DTW. Okay, so I've got D and I've got TW. That's pretty easy. Okay, now right here, let, let's read this. So we're in G21, and then it says G21A for webs of rolled I shaped members with this term, phi is 1. Okay, so let's digest this. So what the spec was saying, what, what did the spec say at the very beginning? The spec said for all provisions in this chapter except G21A, B is 9. And what does G21A say? G21A says if you have a situation where this is true, then CB is 1. Okay. And it also says that B, or sorry, B is 1, and it says that CB is 1. Okay. So what do we have to check? We have to check whether H over TW is less than this. Okay. So what is H over TW? What did we calculate as H over TW? 50.1? Or <coughs> sorry, H over TW is not 1, sorry. H over TW is 51. And what are we checking that against? What are we checking it against? We're checking it against 2.24. It's 50.1. square root of E over Fy. Okay. So what is 2.24? What is 2.24 times the square root of 29,000 over 50? What is that? 53.9. 53.9. Okay. So is H over TW less than 2.24? Square root of U over FY? Yes. So what does that mean? 
What does the spec say that means? That means that B equals 1 and CD equals 1. So therefore, okay. So this is 1. That's one. Well, I don't know about you, but I think we can go ahead and compute this thing. So just to paint what's going on here, that's FY, that's AW, that's CB1, that's CB. And so what do we get when we check all this out? 305.73. 305.73 what? Tips. So we're getting BBN is 305.7 kips, right? And what did the spec, what did table 3.2 say the capacity was? consider shear buckling. But I want to show you something a little bit down here. Okay, It says for all other I-shaped members we have the following. And it says when H over TW is also less than this, CV is 1. Okay, So I want, to, I want to take a look at this real quick. Okay, and, and I just want to show you why this is important. So if H over TW was what? The reason I'm doing this is just because I want to expose you to more specification. Okay? So it also says that when H over TW is less than this, CV is 1. So we have 1.1 square root of this. Okay, so 1.1 square root of KV. I can do better than KVE over FY. Okay? So, what do we got here? We've got EFY and this term KV. What is this term KV? Well, let's see if we can skip ahead a little bit. Now, what's, first off, what's going on here in this section in general? Okay? This section in general is basically saying that as your um, web gets more and more slender, this term CV, you have to compute it. And this term CV does end up getting smaller and smaller uh, than 1. Okay, CV is either 1 or less than 1. Because what it's doing is it's taking your capacity and it's reducing it based on the account that you can't get up to full yielding because the web's going to buckle. Okay, so you have like full plastic capacity, you have an inelastic range, and then you have this, you know, uh, range down here. Okay, 
So how do we determine this term uh, web uh, or this web plate shear buckling coefficient? This web, uh, this term KB. Okay. So we have for when webs do not have transverse stiffeners and for when webs do have transverse stiffeners. So this KB term is it's sort of like a, a, a K, I guess the best way you can describe it is kind of like a K factor for columns. And so the idea is that the further away those stiffeners get, your K changes, okay? But if you don't have any stiffeners at all, we take K to be 5.34, okay? So what happens if we calculate this? So we also find that CV is one this way as well. Does, does that make sense? Okay. There's a reason I'm doing this. Some of you are probably thinking to yourself, wait, Dr. Mike, why are you calculating all this again? We already determined that CV was one. Why are you doing it again? Okay. I had for this shape, I have a web slenderness value of 50.1. Okay. A web slenderness of 50.1 means that phi is 1 and CV is 1. But what if I had a web slenderness of 58? Okay? If I had a web slenderness value of, say, 58, I would have violated this limit, but I would have passed this limit. Okay? So the point I'm making is, that that C or that G two one A, we would have violated that, but that doesn't mean that we don't continue forward in the spec. The other thing that the other point that I guess I wanted to make here is that the spec has a way of um, uh, uh, not contradicting itself. Like for example, we met this first limit so that C V is one. Well, this later limit we also met it so C V is one as well. Like we won't have a situation where C V equals one if you look at this section of the spec, the CV doesn't equal one if you look at another version of the spec. Like the, the spec tries to, the spec does a pretty good job at avoiding contradictions, right? So if you found a situation where you're getting contradicting answers in the spec, I would probably check your math first. You're probably doing something wrong. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. So my point is, um, I just wanted you to see that because you have a homework where that might show up. So... This homework is really short. Um, I want you to compute the shear capacity of a W30 by 90. So it's sort of like what we just did, only do it for, instead of W24 by 62, do it for a W30 by 90. Again, instead of giving you a nice pretty flow chart in the slides like I have up until now, you got to read this. Read it and understand it, okay? Make sure that you follow along what's going on, okay? With me so far? Any questions on this? Okay. Now, a little bit on logistics. I have one question for you that I'm going to let you go. So a little bit on logistics. So I'm giving you homework 6.8 that is due Wednesday, and then homework 7 <coughs> is due on Friday. Okay? I have already pre-recorded the lecture on Wednesday. I have it set to where it will turn on on Wednesday. Would you like me to go ahead and activate it now? Yeah. Would you like me to go ahead and activate that homework now? Yes. So that you can just knock it out. Is that okay? So um, it'll be a little bit later today, but I'm going to turn everything on. 
I'll make a post on Teams so that everybody is crystal clear that we are not going to have an in-person class on Wednesday. Um, on Friday, oh, one other thing about Homework 7. I am turning the solution on to both Homework 6.8 and 7 on Friday. So after Friday, I'm pretty much not accepting any. Like, like I'm not accepting a late assignment for Homework 7 because you'll have the solution as soon as you get it. Okay. Does that sound good? Any questions? Then I will see you all on Friday. I'll pull up the code one more time, but that's all I got, everybody. I'm letting you out.